Well, this morning we are, are going to kick off our, our series here. Um, what we did in Advent, the time leading up to Christmas, was we were looking at the story of Jesus in the book of Luke, and we're going to continue that. And so from now all the way to Easter, we're going to continue in the book of Luke, looking at the story of Jesus, who he was, what he said, what he did. And so we start today that, that process with the story of Jesus being tempted. Um, and, and so we have this opportunity to talk about temptation. And the cool thing about temptation is this. Every single person faces it. Whether you are an infant to a 120 years old, everyone right now faces temptation. And so let me ask you this as we get into this. When was the last time you were tempted? I mean, truly, sincerely, deeply tempted to sin. Having one of those moments where you stood there going, I know this is wrong. I know I shouldn't do this. I know I should turn and flee from this. But I, I don't know that I can. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I won't get caught. Maybe nobody will find out. Maybe I'll get away with this. When was the last time you had one of those moments that you stood there on the edge of making a really bad decision that you knew was wrong, but you just felt compelled to do it? What was it for you? Was it something new that had never come up before? Or was it something that, like clockwork, comes up every day, every week, every month, every year? And then, how did it go for you? Were you able to resist it? Were you able to walk away from it? Or did it get you once again? Because see, today what we're going to be talking about is this. What is temptation? What do we do with it? And, and how do we not be overcome by it? Uh, one of my, my favorite songs, uh, Jeff Buckley redid, Hallelujah. How many of you know the song I'm talking about? Um, and, and in it, he's, there's a, a line talking about King David, and he says, Your faith was strong, but you needed proof. You saw her bathing on the roof. Her beauty in the moonlight overthrew you. And I think that's a very practical way of describing temptation, that it is something that builds up, it is something that just all of a sudden goes higher and higher until it just tsunamis and overtakes us, overthrows us, like a, a dam busting. Sometimes that's what temptation is, is it, it's just one thing on top of another, on top of another, until all of a sudden we just go, fine, I'll just, this once, just this time, I'll, I'll, I'll fix it for later. And it just overthrows us. And so when we look at temptation, um, first let's talk about what it is, where it comes from, what we, what we know about it. And the first thing that we know about temptation is it's something that Satan does. It is an enticement that he lays before us to try and get us to do something against God's will. But here's the good news about temptation. Uh, Hebrews 4.15 uh, tells us this. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness. The high priest they're talking about here is Jesus. We do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. And the first good news is this. We know from right here in the Bible that Jesus never sinned, but yet he faced temptation. So the good news that we have is this. Being tempted is not sinful. See, sometimes Satan wants us to believe that if we even get tempted, if we even get allured, if we even notice sinful things, that we've already taken a step in sin, so we might as well just go all the way. But the Bible is very clear on this. To be tempted is not sin. When you engage in it, when you, when you begin to, to want that, that's when you get into sin. And, and this is good news for us because Satan has lied to us to tell us that, well, because you're tempted, you've already, you're already defeated, so go ahead and go all the way. It, it's kind of like this. I, I liken it to this. Um, uh, we, in our house in Knoxville, we had mice, and, and I had to lay out traps to catch them. And I, I had to learn um, that mice are attracted to all kinds of different things. You know, I had some peanut butter traps. I had some cheese traps. I had some, you know, like we, we laid it all out. And Satan is a lot like that. Satan lays out the traps, and he knows that each one of us have our own flavors, our own things that we're attracted to. And, and so he tries out all the different cheeses. And, and, you know, for this person, they always get caught with Swiss. And some of you are like, Swiss? Really? You fall for Swiss? And they're like, well, you fall for cheddar. Who falls for cheddar? Come on now. And, and so all of us have our own little cheeses that, that are enticing to us. And Satan lays out all of them to say, hey, where, where are you weak? 
where am I going to get you to take a bite? And see, sometimes um, some of us come here on Sundays and we got traps all over us. We're like, yeah, I got caught with Swiss, cheddar, Havarti. You know I love Havarti. And then in, in some of us, it's just a hundred cheddars. And that's, he gets us every time the same way. And then we get to come to church and we get to have those taps taken off and we get to hear that there is hope, there is forgiveness, there is restoration. But that's how Satan works. And he lays it all out there for us to try and see if, if we can get to, to take just one little nibble and then he's got us. And this is why it's so clear in the Bible when it talks about your heart longing for sin. You can see how dangerous it is for a mouse if he goes, man, that cheese smells real good. How close can I get before I touch it? Like maybe if I just get an inch away, maybe if I just get... A quarter of an inch. Maybe if I just lick it. Don't bite it. Just lick it. And that's what God talks about. Your heart longing for sin is dangerous for you because you are going to get ensnared. And the closer you play with it, the closer you play to the fire, the closer you entice yourself with it, the more your heart longs for it, the more you're in danger of being ensnared by Satan. And so each one of us have our flavors. And for some... We don't struggle with one, but we struggle in the other. Whether it's food, sex, fame, money, power, glory, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a husband, a wife, security, money, comfort, whatever it is. Achievement or accolades or grade point averages. We all have our different flavors that entice us. And Satan is the one who baits the trap. Whatever he thinks will compel us to take a chance. Whatever he thinks will cause us to toss danger to the side and consequences to the side. And see, if Satan was honest and he came before us and he said, hey, you know what? I want to destroy your life. I want to lead you to a place of misery and suffering and torture and sadness. I'd like you to experience divorce and obesity and addiction and poverty and despair. None of us would fall for that. None of us would be like, yeah, sign me up. That sounds great. That is his goal and everything. It's to destroy your life. But he comes at it with much, much more enticing bait. And when you turn one away, he just baits another trap with something else. But see, the comforting part about all of this is as we read our lesson for today, which is on the, the back of our bulletin if you want to take any notes. When we read our lesson for today, what we learn is this, that Jesus was tempted in every way. Jesus was tempted in every way, and what we learned was he was able to resist all temptation. He didn't excuse himself as God. He didn't excuse himself from it. He didn't cheat and use his powers to make it easier. He is sympathetic. He's been there, and he understands. And you might sit there and say, you know what? Well, he never sinned. So he doesn't understand how tempting temptation actually is. But the, the thing is, is, that's just not true. The one who finishes the race perfect, knows even more how tempting temptation is. It, it's kind of like this. I, I, I liken it to this. Um, my wife uh, um, did cross country growing up, runs marathons, you know. Um, me, I would need a segue to get to like the first mile. Um, that's just our difference. I, I don't have that willpower that all of a sudden when the cramps start, I'm just like, yep, done. And, and she, she has finished the race. So here's the thing. I could say, hey, honey, you don't know how hard it is to run through the cramps and to, to not collapse and to not give up. And she would go, uh, yeah, I finished the race. I know what it is. I know how hard it is. I know how to endure through it. And it's the same with Jesus. We don't sit there and go, well, he was God. He was perfect. That was easy for him. He faced everything and endured through it and never failed. And so he says, listen to me. Watch what I did. Learn from me, and you have me to help you through this. And so let's look at what happens here in our text. The first thing we see is this, that Jesus is fasting. And fasting is an important biblical practice, it's a spiritual practice. And what it is, is you withhold yourself from eating food so that you focus everything on God. You, you say, God, you are better than food. You are all I want. You are my desire. You are what I am after. And so every time you begin to get hungry, you, you withhold from food and you instead pray. And you say, God, I don't need food. I need you. 
God, I, I don't need the comfort things. I need you. And so that's what fasting is. And Jesus is fasting. And fasting is something for all of us to do at any time. If we feel compelled or led to do this, we can do this. Um, where we say, I want to refocus on God. I want to take away all the, the comforts. And I just want in every way to be praying and connecting to him. And so Jesus goes through 40 days of not eating and just praying to God. And during that time, Satan is there enticing him. And so the first one that we see, the first temptation, is Satan comes to him and he says, look, if, important word there, if you are the son of God, take these stones right here, we're out in the desert, take these stones and turn them to bread. And the thing is, is Satan knows he is the son of God. And Satan knows he is hungry. And this is what Satan is after. Is eating bread sinful? No. This is what Satan's after. Satan wants Jesus to use his powers for his own purposes. See, all throughout the scriptures, Jesus has been saying, I am here to serve my Father's will. I'm here to walk in my Father's will. I'm here to do what my Father says. And G Satan comes to him and goes, what about you, man? What about taking care of you? You got the power? Take care of you. Worry about you. And, and think about how this will come into play later when Jesus willfully takes on the punishment and the beatings and the sorrow of the cross. And he doesn't excuse himself away. He doesn't walk away. He willfully walks towards it. And, and Satan's saying, look, man, don't do that. Think about you. What's best for you? And what's interesting is Jesus uh, comes back at him and he, and he quotes part of this verse from Deuteronomy 8. Uh, Deuteronomy 8, 3 says, He humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that, and this is what Jesus responds with, man does not live on bread alone. And then it, Jesus stops his quote, but the rest of it is, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And so Jesus' first response is, he says, take care of yourselves, feed yourself. As he goes, look, man doesn't live on bread alone. Th these comfort things, these food things, these aren't what matter. What matters is God's word and following him. And I obey him. If God wants to feed me, he'll feed me. If God wants to put bread in front of me, he'll put bread in front of me. I'm not going to use my powers to take care of myself. And, and this is important to note. What we learn from this is this, that, that God gives us all kinds of good things. Uh, there's nothing sinful about bread or eating. But these appetites that we have for things, food, drink, fun, romance, rest, when we start obeying Satan with these things, they become sinful to us. When we take something beautiful like food that God gives us and we're supposed to enjoy, and all of a sudden we make addictions out of it and we make cravings out of it and we, we get unhealthy with it. Or romance, God gives us romance. But when we get unhealthy with it, when we start doing things that Satan would want us to do with it instead of what God wants, then it becomes sinful. And so even in the little things, are we going to obey what God wants for these things? Or are we going to obey what, what Satan would want us to do with these things? To make them what life is all about. Because that's what Jesus responds with. Look, life isn't about bread. Life isn't about comfort. Life is about following the will of God and his word. And so he wins that round, so Satan rebates the, uh, the trap. And so he takes Jesus up and he shows them all the kingdoms of the world. And he says, all of this is yours if you just bow down and worship me. Satan says, I have the power to give it all to you. You'll be worshipped, you'll be adored, you, you'll be taken care of. All of this is yours. And Jesus quickly responds with Deuteronomy 6.13. And, and it says this, Fear the Lord your God, serve him only, and take your oaths in his name. And Jesus responds with, Worship the Lord your God and worship him only. And, and what's interesting here is Satan tempts him with prosperity. Jesus, he, he, he comes to Jesus and he says, I, I thought you were the son of God. You, you deserve nice things. Shouldn't you be eating royal feast and, and not starving? Shouldn't you be living in a palace and not a barren wilderness? Shouldn't you have servants not left to tend for yourself? See, Satan says, look, I'll make you comfortable. This is his lie to all of us. I'll make you comfortable. I'll make you successful. I'll make you powerful. I'll fill your stomach. I'll give you pleasures. This is his, 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 pro, his process for all of us is to try and get us comfortable. To where we say, you know what? I, I don't need you, God. I, I have everything taken care of. I have my food, I have my comfort, I have my pleasure, I have my money, I have my, my security, I have everything I need. I don't need you, God. And so immediately he's hitting him with this prosperity. And the sad thing is, is Satan does this in the church too. And we talk about this in Prosperity Gospel, that there's a group of Christians that, that would sit there and say, you know what, 
you know what kind of Christianity I want? I want the Christianity where nothing bad happens. I want the Christianity that the day I believe, it is just gold streets and amazing. I want no sorrow. I want no, I don't want no struggles. I want the day I start believing, I want everything to go perfect. And there are garbage preachers out there that will sit there and tell people that to get them to come. And Satan goes, oh, here's a guy. Let's get him a book deal and let's get him a big church and everybody's going to think he's legit. And people follow him. And it's all a lie from Satan to chase prosperity. To chase prosperity. But Jesus responds just the way that he's supposed to. Look, I, I'm to worship God alone, not myself. I don't deserve the worship. God deserves the worship alone. And then Satan tries again. And Satan takes him to the high point of the temple in Jerusalem. And he says, look, and this is interesting here. Jesus is standing on the temple, and Satan is going to begin to quote the Bible itself to him. Satan and, and the demons, they know God's word. They, they plant face, false pastors everywhere to try and tempt us away. And, and so Satan himself starts quoting this verse to Jesus. and says, look, this, this refers to you, that God's not going to let anything happen to you. Throw yourself down and see. See, he's going to stop it. He's not going to let you get hurt. And Jesus responds with Deuteronomy 6.16. 6, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. And Jesus says, look, you quoted this verse, but you misapplied it, Satan. It, it doesn't mean, hey, go ahead and test God to make him prove who he is. It, this verse, what you were quoting, tells us that if you faithfully serve him, he will lovingly help you in a time of need. That's what that verse means. And so as we look at what Jesus does in his response, it gives us a couple points to close with. And the first one is this. And this is the biggest point here today. Satan is real. Satan is real. And sometimes we, we step back and we go, come on, Pastor. Like, I hear you say that, but, you know, this is just something churches do. It, it, it's, it's something they do to get fear out of people, to get them to respond, to manipulate them. You know, Satan, you know, oh, Satan's after you. Satan's going to try and tempt you. It's just something you say. And I, this is a great line. It's from a couple movies they quote it, but the greatest trick that the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. It is true. The greatest trick he ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. It, he sits there and he goes, there's, there's no one after you. You don't need to worry. Go and be comfortable. Go and, go and do what you want to do. Don't worry about me. Or there's those people that come and say, you know what, Pastor, I'm, I'm educated. I've, I've been to college. I, I've looked through a telescope and a microscope. I've never seen any demons or, or any devil. I, the, 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 come on. Those are fairy tales. There's no real Satan and demons out there. I'm far too educated to believe that. And remember this, that Satan is the father of lies. And that he works through our pride. That he, he wants us to feel prideful. He wants us to say, I'm too smart for that. I'm too smart to fall for that. I know better. I'm better educated. I know better that that's not true. That's what he wants. And, and listen to this. If, if you think Satan doesn't know people, look at the three temptations that he gave Jesus. The first one, love yourself. Take care of yourself. Love yourself. Take care of yourself. Put yourself first. Then he says, eh, you know what? Get the love of all the people. Be worshipped and adored by all the people. Be, be uh, all in charge and have everyone serving you. Get the, all the acclaim and the power and the authority. Worship, have people worship you. And the third one, he says, you know what? Get all the power and the glory. Have the, even the angels and God serving you. Make you the center of the universe. Tell me that Satan doesn't know us. Love yourself. Get people to adore you and love you. And get all the power and authority for yourself. How many of you would have fallen to one of those? If Satan truly stood before you and said, I'll give this to you. He knows us, and he's after us. And so the question is, what do we do? Well, the first thing we do is this. We treat Satan as a real enemy. That means that, that we acknowledge Satan is real, and that we understand that he is tempting you. That as you go through your life, and all of a sudden you have that moment that you say, 
man, I'm really getting pulled towards this. I know this isn't right. That you acknowledge what it is. This is Satan trying to tempt me. This is some flavor of cheese that he's putting out, and there's a trap coming. I know better. I'm going to walk away. Because if you are never going to acknowledge that Satan is real, and you're never going to understand that he is after you, you are going to fall into his trap every time. Because to you, it just looks like cheese. There's no trap. And oh, how was I supposed to know this was all going to go bad? Well, because there's someone out there who wants to destroy you. So the first thing we have to do is treat Satan like a real enemy. The second thing we, we need to do is to remember that Jesus is victorious. Jesus was the one who was able to resist all temptation. And so we need to pray to him and learn from him. Learn what he did. The first thing he did was he counterpunched with biblical truth. When the world said, this is what you should go after, this is enticing, he said, no, God's truth says this, and this is what I'll go after. True joy is found in these things, not these things. And he counterpunched with biblical truth. And he understood that he had the Holy Spirit inside of him to give him strength, just as you do. If you, as a baptized believer, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you to give you strength. If you're not baptized, let's get you baptized. And the, the, the last thing that we understand about this is that our identity is found in Christ alone. We are not the struggle that we have. Though we might sit there and say, you know what, I'm an alcoholic and, and you know, I always fight to have a drink. We are not the struggle that we have. God comes to us and says, you are my child. You are not an alcoholic. You are my child. That is what you struggle with, but you are my beloved child. Know your identity. That it's found in a victorious Jesus who stands above every sin, every sorrow, and says, you have victory over this in my name. This is not who you are. You are not this mistake. You are not this person that needs to be ashamed. You are this child that needs to understand that you have victory over this. The third thing that we want to understand from the scriptures is this, that escape is always possible. This is a Bible verse that tells us this, that whenever we face temptation, there is always an avenue away. There's always an escape route. That even though we face these things, that God will never give us more than we can handle. That there is always a way. And sometimes the world tries to tell us, oh, no, no, no. You've already taken a step in. You're, you're trapped. You just go all the way in. But God tells us there's always a way out. It might mean humbling yourself. It might mean swallowing your pride. It might mean having to start back over. But there's always a way out. And Satan, the Bible tells us this as well. The Bible says that Satan eventually gives up. There's a verse that tells us, resist the devil and he will flee from you. That eventually he will relent. And so hold strong and understand that there's always an escape route. And the last one is this. And this is as truthful as we can be about this. Repent whenever you fail. You are going to fail. Some of us a lot. And that's not a moment to go, you know what? I should just accept this. This is who I am. I'm this failure. I'm this person that always falls for cheddar cheese. That is who I am. I am just a cheddar cheese failure. And God says, no. No, you're not. Come and understand that all you have to do is repent. We take the traps off. We get a fresh start. We get healed. We get strengthened. We get renewed. We get encouraged. That that is not the end. Because this is the truth. Life is a battle with many rounds. And you are going to win some rounds and you are going to lose some rounds. But life is a battle. And the war is not done until the last day. Just as we sang, you know, that, um, or we're about to sing, uh, that on the day that love conquers all, on that day when everything's done, that we will stand face to face with him. And that's when the battle is finally done. But until now, you are going to have some wins and you're going to have some losses, but we don't ever give up. And we don't ever give in and just say, well, I'm just going to accept this for my life. This is who I am. Jesus says, there is victory found in me. Don't give up. Don't give up. And so this is my encouragement to you today as we go to a time of confession and prayer is that you have a chance to speak honestly with God who honestly knows what you already struggle with. He already knows what your battles are. He already knows what your failures are. He already knows what your weaknesses are. And he says, look, I want you to say it. I want you to acknowledge to me that you know this is what Satan tempts you with. If there was a top five list, admit it to him. Admit it to God and say, I know he goes after this, 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 and this. 
and I fall all the time. God, help me with these things. Because the first step is actually admitting where we're weak. Admitting where we're failing. Admitting where Satan has a foothold in our life. And giving God the, the permission to say, God, I, I want you to battle this. I want you to help me to battle this. And so let's bow our heads and close our eyes and join in prayer. Heavenly Father, you know our sins, you know our struggles, you know our weaknesses. And so, Lord, let us get right with you. Let us admit our temptations that we just fall for every time. Let us admit where we are trapped in sin right now. And let us get right with you and confess this to you now. Lord God, you hear our confessions. You know the things that we have confessed and you know the things that we still need to confess. We pray that you would convict our hearts and our minds to confess those things we still need to. And Lord, we pray that what we have already confessed, what we already know right off the top that we need to repent of, Lord, we pray that you would forgive us in the name of your son, Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. God loves you. He loves you so much that no matter how many times you fall in the same sin, no matter how many different ways you fall into sin, no matter how many times a day you struggle, He loves you so much that He sent His Son, Jesus, and He said, that perfect life that Jesus lived, I'm going to give that to you as credit. And Jesus is going to take your failure life, and He's going to pay the price for it. And that is the gospel, that even though you don't deserve it, even though you are unworthy of it, that God sets you free and punishes Jesus instead. And the good news that I have for you is this, that upon your confession, God has heard your confession and he forgives you, completely, wholeheartedly forgives you. And he doesn't forget what you've done. He knows it and forgives you anyways because he remembers it upon Jesus on the cross but you will not be held accountable for it because of what Jesus has done. And that is the amazing grace of God. And you get to walk away from here forgiven in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said,